Good evening, everyone. It's probably best I don't see anyone. <laughs> You may think it takes some nerve for a Russian and the son of an ex-KGB officer to stand here in front of you and talk about press freedom in this country. <laughs> Let me tell you about my early years. I lived in a closed, dark society where free travel, free expression, and certainly free speech did not exist. You had to read a foreign newspaper to find out what was going on in your own country. I was 15 when men with guns came for my father. I can remember him being harassed but standing firm. He was targeted because of his determination to talk and operate openly at a time when perestroika and glasnost were newly formed words. Ladies and gentlemen, press freedom is a universal ideal, but its currency differs around the world. In Russia, people die for it. So it is not something we take lightly. The day we bought the Evening Standard, a young journalist from Nova Gazeta, Anastasia Baburova, and a young lawyer representing the paper's interests, Stanislav Markelov, was buried. They were murdered for their anti-fascist campaigning work. This followed the murder of another one of our journalists, Anna Politkovskaya. It is not easy to identify the gangsters between such attacks on press freedom in Russia. What I know for certain is that the more press freedom there is, the less opportunity there is for such intimidation and threats. Where there's absence of press freedom, the levels of corruption and oppression rise. This is well documented. The more restricted the media, the more corrupt the country, the more oppressive the government, until eventually a stage is reached when no one holds the public officials and other powerful individuals and institutions to account. It is to our enormous credit in this country that we can work ourselves into a lather over MPs overclaimed expenses of 30 pounds and Chris Hune's driving points. <laughs> Issues at which the French would shrug their shoulders and about which, unfortunately, my Russian countrymen would feel utterly bemused. Just look at Bahrain, where four journalists have recently been charged with writing false stories about the kingdom's crackdown on opposition movement. The government, infuriated by its inability to control the news flow about the country abroad, recently issued a libel threat over the independence coverage by a respected Middle East correspondent, Robert Fisk. Alongside the obvious advantages of press freedom, we must address its abuses. I say this because if we do not safeguard our press freedom, we risk losing it. I'm shocked by the sheer extent of phone hacking, undercard tracking, rubbish sifting of celebrities in this country. I'm equally disturbed by the alleged phone tapping, bank account blagging, and email hacking of high-level terrorist informers, members of the royal family, the governor of the Bank of England, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, the deputy prime minister, home secretary, trade secretary, culture secretary, and possibly even the sitting prime minister. The phone hacking of a murdered schoolgirl, Millie Dower, as exposed in today's papers, is quite simply disgusting. Those responsible should hang their heads in shame. 
The response to this criminal activity, this theft of privacy, has in my view been manifestly inadequate. This does not represent the failure of legislation. It represents a failure of enforcement of the existing legislation. At what point will the government acknowledge the illegal surveillance of the individuals has long since moved from fantasy realm of one long ro ro rogue reporter working alongside a single newspaper and that a public inquiry at the very least is required? At what point will we admit that this illegal surveillance represents one of the biggest scandals in public life in post-war Britain. Because I believe that a free press is as much a fundamental part of a civilized society as respect for privacy. I expect my editors at the Evening Standard and the Independent to make correct distinctions between what is in the public interest and what interests the public. The, the Fred Goodwin super injunction case, for example, shows that this distinction is not always clear cut and cannot always be made. The judiciary take, took the view in his case, as elsewhere, that it is no one else's business what he got up to under his desk and after hours. <laughs> Yet how do we know that the alleged affair with the senior executive of RBS did not have a bearing on the decisions he took immediately before the bank so spectacularly crashed at such a cost to the taxpayer? Under the Human Rights Act, judges are required to balance the right to privacy with the right to free expression, but they are supposed to give special regard to the latter. In several recent super injunction cases, it is hard to see how they have been doing that. The Goodwin case and others suggest that they are ignoring what Parliament framed as a safeguard for pre-press and, in effect, rewriting the laws themselves. You know, sometimes I wonder if only way to bring these judges into the 21st century is to pass a law forcing them on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> of still greater concern is the suggestion, which has been done to me personally by some members of the government and other commentators, that this could be addressed by a new privacy law. Such a law would be a threat to our democracy. English law essentially is practical, yet super injunctions are increasingly impractical in the modern world. They can't even extend to countries within the United Kingdom. So how can anyone pretend that in an age of pan-global media, these injunctions are not completely obsolete? They have no value at all to people who want to keep their secrets private. And on the contrary, they have now quite the opposite effect, as some recent cases have shown. I know that one of our speakers tonight, Max Mosley, believes that newspapers must inform subjects before they expose them. I strongly disagree with that. Has anyone heard of police informing a suspect that they're a subject of invest an investigation? Of course not, and I know that at least one current investigation that is taking place in our newspapers would be hopelessly compromised if we had to disclose this information prematurely. Of course, in 99% of the time, journalists do ask a person about who is written about to respond, but to make this compulsory will compromise legitimate press investigations. Let me be absolutely clear. I hold no brief whatsoever for the excesses of our tabloid press. Indeed, I think some papers have shown an utter and unacceptable disregard for even the basic legislation surrounding privacy. You cannot hold public figures to account 
if you can't hold yourself to account. You cannot have one foot on the moral ground and the other in the moral mire. It is neither a convincing, ethical, or elegant stance. But why pick on the more salacious tabloids? The deceit practiced on Vince Cable by the Telegraph was just as equally unethical. Power without responsibility, the British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin called it eight years ago. So for a moment, back to the phone hacking. This theft of information, this illegal collusion between the press, the police, is not responsible journalism, for which I or my newspapers want any part of. All newspapers should embody values of ethical journalism. Until recently, the British press could justifiably call itself nation's conversation in print, and if fame and celebrity took a little bruising from time to time, it was a price, price worth paying for freedom of speech. Because it ensured that this country, of which I'm proud to call myself a citizen, remains one of the least corrupt countries in the world. These are tough times for everyone, and the newspaper industry is no exception. 24-hour television news, the internet, and social media all have encroached on the printed word. Proper reporting is in danger of becoming a diminishing asset. It is expensive, so digital media tends to take our news. So some newspapers will go to the wall, and there's little doubt that there'll be fewer newspapers in five years' time. But the answer is not a race to the gutter. If we don't act responsibly and ethically, then we only have ourselves to blame. We'll be doing ourselves and ultimately society a terrible wrong. A free press is as much part of democracy as free elections, the Magna Carta, and the unwritten constitution. It is vital that the decision about what we print remains in the hands of the press. But unless that judgment is used responsibly and in the public interest, the power to make that judgment will go to the court in one direction and to the internet in the other. If we don't clean up our acts, Others will do it for us. That would be bad for the press, bad for democracy, and bad for Britain. Thank you.